Sandy Koufax had arguably the most insane prime of any pitcher in baseball history. With an explosive fastball, devastating curveball, and flawless pitching motion, Koufax was a dominant force on the mound during the 1960s. His opponents knew what pitches were coming, but the high velocity and pinpoint command made Sandy practically unhittable. When the Dodgers needed him most, Koufax was remarkable, especially in the World Series. The historic peak earned him the nickname the left arm of God, and his early retirement led to him accomplishing what no other Hall of Famer has. Thank you to everyone for the suggestions, and make sure to leave a comment on who you want to see next. Koufax is one of my grandfather's all-time favorite players, so this video is dedicated to him. As always, if you enjoy, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing. Make sure to follow me on Instagram at cam23 underscore yt and hit the bell to enable all notifications so you don't miss any future cam23 videos. Sanford Braun was born on December 30th, 1935, in Brooklyn, New York, to parents Evelyn and Jack. Sandy's parents divorced when he was three years old, leading him to spend most of his childhood with his maternal grandparents. His grandfather, Max, instilled in him Jewish values and religion, beliefs that he would hold close throughout his life. At the age of nine, his mother remarried and Sandy took on his stepfather Irving's last name, Koufax. While attending Lafayette High School at 14 years old, Koufax showed more talent in basketball than he did in baseball. His rebounding skills and vertical jump would attract attention from college universities. Milton Lorry, a delivery driver for the New York Journal American, was one of the initial believers in Sandy's potential as a pitcher. Despite his struggles, Milton saw a future star and extended an invitation to join his Coney Island Sports League team. After high school, Sandy accepted a scholarship from the University of Cincinnati to play basketball. He was the starting forward on the freshman team and was outstanding at rebounding and dunking. Ed Jucker, Sandy's basketball and baseball coach, believed that he could have played pro basketball. In baseball, Sandy threw heat but was wild on the mound. Within a few starts, he went from a rough outing to striking out a school record 18 batters. He finished the year with 32 innings pitched, struck out 51, but also walked 30. Nonetheless, his raw ability caught the eyes of Major League Scouts. The Yankees, Giants, and Dodgers, the three New York teams at that time, were interested in signing Koufax. After much deliberation with his stepfather, Sandy signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers on December 14, 1954, as an amateur free agent. He received a $6,000 salary and a $14,000 signing bonus. Back then, rules stated that a signing bonus larger than $4,000 prohibited teams from sending such players to the minor leagues. For better or worse, Koufax was instantly sent to the Major League squad. After transferring to Columbia University and enrolling in architecture-based courses, he quickly realized that balancing the requirement to serve six months in the military with playing baseball was quite challenging. In 1955, his MLB debut was delayed due to an injured ankle that sidelined him for two months. On June 24th, he got into his first game as a relief pitcher. He fired two scoreless innings and struck out two. His first start on July 6th was a mixed bag. He allowed just one run on three hits, but walked a staggering eight batters in four and two-thirds innings. Even when healthy, Koufax did not receive much playing time due to his inexperience on a World Series contending Dodgers team. A highlight from his rookie season was a complete game shutout on August 27th. He struck out 14 batters and earned his first career win. He finished the year with 41 and two-thirds innings under his belt and a 3.02 ERA. The Dodgers would finish atop the National League and advance to play the Yankees in the World Series. It wasn't until 1969 that the MLB playoffs were expanded to include the League Championship Series. Brooklyn won a hard-fought seven-game series to claim their first title in franchise history. Koufax did not receive an opportunity to pitch. Sandy played sparingly in 1956 and struggled to harness his control. The lack of regular playing time made it difficult to improve. In just 58 and two-thirds innings, his ERA ballooned to 4.91. The Dodgers rematched the Yankees in the World Series, but were bested by New York this time around, falling in seven games. Koufax did not pitch in this series. Sandy spent the offseason playing winter ball in Puerto Rico. This experience would build up his arm to a heavier workload in 1957. Koufax got 100 innings of work for the first time, but still had difficulty limiting base runners. He allowed 51 walks and recorded a 3.88 ERA in 34 games, 13 of which were starts. To conclude the regular season, Sandy pitched the final inning, making him the last player to take the mound for the Brooklyn Dodgers. The franchise relocation to Los Angeles was approved in May, but was not announced until October. 
Until their new home stadium was constructed, the Dodgers played at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. In 1958, Sandy revealed to teammate Carl Erskine that he was planning on quitting and was going to buy into a radio station after the season. However, Koufax received more opportunities than ever, appearing in 40 games. He made 26 starts, threw 158 and two-thirds innings, but walked 105 batters. His six walks per nine innings and league-leading 17 wild pitches were alarming, but Sandy decided to stick it out. He would wait one more year before making a final decision regarding his future in baseball. In 1959, Koufax got off to a brutal start, failing to make it into the fourth inning in each of his four April starts. In May, he was shifted back and forth between the rotation and the bullpen. Koufax felt like the Dodgers were on the verge of cutting ties with him. When all hope seemed lost, he was able to turn things around in June by completing and winning three consecutive games, one of which was a shutout. Inconsistencies were still prevalent throughout the remainder of the season. However, Koufax started another remarkable stretch in late August. On the 24th, he tossed a complete game, allowed two runs, and struck out 13. His next outing mirrored the previous one, allowing two runs over nine innings, earning the win, and striking out an incredible 18 batters. In his next start, he held the Cubs scoreless into the 10th inning until Ernie Banks socked a three-run homer. The Dodgers were shut out and lost three to nothing. The Dodgers would go on to win the National League pennant and face the White Sox in the World Series. Finally, Koufax would have an opportunity to contribute in their title run. He pitched two scoreless innings of relief in an 11-0 Dodgers loss in Game 1. LA had a 3-1 series lead entering Game 5, and Koufax made his first World Series start. Unfortunately, the Dodgers provided no run support for their starting pitcher. Koufax fired seven innings of one-run ball, allowing just five hits and a walk. The White Sox took Game 5, 1-0. With a 9-3 victory in Game 6, the Dodgers secured their first championship in LA. In 1960, Koufax was unable to lock down a spot as a full-time starting pitcher, but led the league with an impressive 10.1 strikeouts per nine. Even so, he was unhappy with the results, but decided not to throw in the towel just yet. In 1961, during a spring training game, Koufax walked the first three batters. Catcher Norm Sherry went out for a mound visit and offered some advice. Sandy, what you really need to do now is take something off the ball, lay it in there and let them hit the ball and we can get some outs. This instruction changed the trajectory of Koufax's career. Sandy said it best himself. I became a good pitcher when I stopped trying to make them miss the ball and started trying to make them hit it. Koufax also dedicated more time to his game plan and the mental aspect of the game. Whether it was establishing the outer half of the plate with the fastball or playing mind games with hitters, Sandy came into his own on the mound. He had an excellent first half. In 22 games, 18 being starts, Koufax won 11 games, posted a 3.32 ERA, and was selected to his first All-Star team. From 1959 to 1962, Major League Baseball hosted two All-Star games to raise money for the Players' Pension Fund under the Collective Bargaining Agreement. This is why Sandy made two appearances in 1961. Koufax had a solid second half to his breakout campaign and made the final game at the LA Coliseum a grand finale. He twirled a 13-inning complete game, struck out 15, walked just three batters, and did so with 205 pitches. Koufax ended the season with 18 wins, a 3.52 ERA, and received MVP votes. He led the league in strikeouts with 269 and was 48 ahead of second place Camilo Pasquale for the MLB lead. Koufax also led the league in hits per nine, Ks per nine, strikeout to walk ratio, and FIP. For those who don't know, FIP stands for Fielding Independent Pitching. It's similar to ERA, but focuses on what the pitcher has the most control over, such as strikeouts, walks, hit by pitches, and home runs. In 1961, Koufax started a chain of six consecutive seasons to lead the league in this category. Considering his past struggles with command, it was encouraging to see such a drastic improvement. 1962 was the inaugural season played at Dodger Stadium. The field dimensions made it a pitcher's paradise, and Sandy would elevate his game to new heights. On April 24th against the Cubs, he tossed a complete game, allowed two runs, and struck out 18 in a Dodgers win. 
He was locked in in the following start as well, tossing a complete game, allowing a single run, and winning his fourth game of April. However, it was during this start that he suffered a career-threatening injury to his left index finger. Surprisingly, it occurred while he was in the batter's box. Koufax, a natural right-handed hitter, decided to spin around and hit lefty to shield his throwing arm from a pitched ball. It was during his first at-bat of the game that he was jammed in on the hands, and somehow, Koufax was able to put the ball in play and got an infield single. Unfortunately, this led to him developing a circulatory condition known as Raynaud's syndrome. The numbness in his finger presented a new challenge, but his legendary announcer Vin Scully once said, Sandy is as tough as they come. On June 30th, Koufax threw his first no-hitter against the Mets. He struck out 13 batters and walked five. To start the game, he tossed what is known as an immaculate inning, recording three strikeouts on nine straight strikes. Sandy made the All-Star team for the second year in a row, but shortly thereafter spent two months off the field while dealing with the blood clot in his finger. There was a possibility that if left unresolved, amputation would have to be considered. Luckily, he received injections that provided relief for the condition. Koufax returned in late September, but his endurance had been zapped due to his extended absence. The Dodgers faded late in the season and missed the playoffs. In 1962, Sandy led the league in ERA, FIP, WHIP, hits per nine, and case per nine. With a 2.54 ERA, he won his first ERA title and received MVP votes. While injuries limited Sandy to just 184 and a third innings pitched, he had established himself as the superstar that the Dodgers always believed he could be. The amazing truth is that Koufax was able to find success while tipping his curveball. According to Hall of Famer Ernie Banks, he was the greatest pitcher I ever saw. Most of the time, we knew what was coming. He held his hands closer to his head when he threw a curveball, but it didn't matter. To know what was coming and still not have a chance is a testament to Sandy's talent. In 1963, Koufax took his game to the next level. On April 19th, he pitched another immaculate inning and dominated the Houston Colt 45s in a complete game shutout. He struck out 14 batters. Sandy missed three starts in late April and early May, but quickly dispelled any injury concerns by tossing his second career no-hitter against the Giants on May 11th. He was nearly flawless, allowing just two walks, one of which occurred with two outs in the ninth inning. Then, in his first three starts of July, Koufax was exceptional. He threw three consecutive shutouts, allowing a total of nine hits and two walks. His last shutout was the best of the trio, as he struck out 13 batters and lowered his ERA to 1.63. His scoreless streak got up to 33 innings. Taking the ball every fourth day, Koufax had an absurd first half of the 1963 season. He won 14 games and only lost three, posted a ridiculous 1.73 ERA, and threw eight shutouts. He allowed just 34 walks and struck out 150 batters in 156 and a third innings pitched. Koufax was selected to the All-Star team and had an excellent second half. He played a pivotal role for a Dodgers team contending for another World Series appearance. Koufax finished the year with 25 wins, a 1.88 ERA, 306 strikeouts, 20 complete games, 11 shutouts, and a .875 whip. By leading the league in wins, ERA, and strikeouts, he claimed the MLB Triple Crown. He led the National League in shutouts, FIP, whip, hits per nine, strikeout to walk ratio, and pitching war. His 306 strikeouts were 41 ahead of Jim Maloney for the MLB lead, and Koufax had four more shutouts than the next closest pitchers, Ray Herbert and Warren Spahn. The Dodgers won the pennant and matched up with the Yankees in the Fall Classic. Things had changed since their last encounter in 1956. This time, it required a cross-country flight. The untouchable Koufax would start game one. He answered the call and delivered nine innings of two-run ball. With five Ks to open a World Series game, Koufax tied an MLB record. In the complete game, he fanned a then-World Series record 15 batters. The only player to surpass it was Bob Gibson in 1968 when he struck out 17. The Dodgers took Game 1 by a 5-2 score. With a narrow 1-0 win in Game 3, LA took a 3-0 series lead, and Koufax took the hill with a chance to bring home the title. Sandy was dealing from start to finish. He allowed six hits, no walks, and one earned run in a complete game win. The Dodgers swept the Yankees to capture their second title in five years. Unsurprisingly, Koufax took home World Series MVP honors. 
Sandy's historic 1963 regular season was rewarded with a unanimous Cy Young selection. Until 1967, there was only one Cy Young winner for all of Major League Baseball. He also took home the MVP award. Just 11 pitchers have won both awards in the same season. Koufax was able to achieve this despite developing arthritis in his left elbow. He rubbed capsulin on it before games and soaked it in an ice bath after games. He also took medication reminiscent of ibuprofen in modern day. This ailment carried over to the beginning of 1964. Before it manifested, Koufax made history by becoming the first to pitch three career immaculate innings. Since then, Max Scherzer and Chris Sale are the only two pitchers to replicate this. In his next start, Sandy could only pitch one inning. To recuperate, he took 12 days off before his next outing. After his brief absence, he fired 10 innings of one-run ball. A month later, on June 4th, he recorded his third no-hitter against the Phillies. He allowed Dick Allen to reach via a walk, but Allen was promptly caught stealing. Koufax came ever so close to perfection. He struck out 12 and faced the minimum number of batters in this brilliant start. Sandy tossed four more complete games in June, two of which were shutouts. He had an unreal .71 ERA for the month and was selected to the All-Star team for the fourth consecutive year. On August 8th, Koufax landed on his elbow as he dove back to second on a pickoff attempt. This freak accident caused his arthritis to flare up to excruciating levels. August 16th was his final start of 1964. By season's end, he led the league with a 1.74 ERA and took home his third ERA title. While he only pitched in 29 games, he registered 19 wins. He compiled league-leading totals in shutouts, ERA+, FIP, WHIP, hits per nine, and case per nine. He received MVP votes and finished third in Cy Young voting behind Dean Chance and Larry Jackson. In 1965, Koufax made an adjustment to his routine. To lessen the pain, he stopped pitching side sessions in between starts. This change propelled him to withstand the biggest workload of his career. He made 21 first half starts, amassing 15 victories, a 2.13 ERA, and 195 strikeouts. Sandy made the all-star team and was lights out in the second half. The Dodgers were fighting for the number one seed in the National League, going in and out of first place all season long. On September 9th, Koufax had an all-time great performance against the Cubs. The Dodgers managed one hit and provided only one run of support, but that was all Sandy needed. He was flawless, striking out 14 batters and etching his name into history with a perfect game. Only 24 times has a pitcher accomplished this feat. Koufax also became the first pitcher to achieve four no-hitters. While he still holds the National League record, Nolan Ryan surpassed him with seven during his career. Sandy finished the year with his second MLB Triple Crown. He won 26 games, posted a 2.04 ERA, and struck out 382 batters. In addition, he led the league in innings, FIP, WHIP, hits per nine, Ks per nine, strikeout to walk ratio, and complete games with 27. Koufax won his fourth consecutive ERA title and also shattered Rube Waddell's modern strikeout record by 33 Ks. Nolan Ryan came along in 1973 and set the record that still stands with 383 strikeouts, edging Sandy by a single K. In the final week of the regular season, the Dodgers clinched first place and were set to battle the Twins in the World Series. Game 1 was scheduled for October 6th, and it just so happened to fall on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish year. Koufax chose not to pitch, and this decision garnered national media attention. His dedication to the faith was an inspiration to the American Jewish community. The Dodgers struggled to start the series. In games 1 and 2, they scored just 3 runs and allowed 13 runs combined. In game 2, Koufax pitched 6 innings, allowed 2 runs, 1 earned, but was handed the loss. Luckily, Claude Osteen came through with a complete game shutout in game 3. Don Drysdale allowed just two runs in Game 4 as the Dodgers evened the series at two games apiece. Koufax got the ball in Game 5 and dominated in a complete game shutout. He allowed just four hits, walked one, and struck out ten. LA traveled to Minnesota for Game 6, leading the series 3-2. The Twins were able to force a Game 7, and instead of Drysdale pitching on three days rest, Koufax got the ball in a crucial situation. On just two days rest, Sandy was electric despite not having his best curveball. He went the distance, shutting out the Twins while striking out 10. The Dodgers won 2 to nothing and secured their fourth title in franchise history. Koufax was named World Series MVP, and rightfully so. 
For the 1965 regular season, he received his second Cy Young Award and finished runner-up to Willie Mays in MVP voting. Koufax was able to replicate the durability he showcased in 65 during his 1966 campaign. In a 14-start stretch from May 10th to July 5th, Sandy pitched 12 complete games, missing just two innings of work in total. He maintained a remarkable 1.16 ERA over 124 innings. All the while, he was receiving cortisone injections into his elbow joint. The arthritis was incurable, but it helped Koufax to cope with the pain to a certain capacity. Sandy made the All-Star team for the sixth year in a row and continued to be a workhorse down the stretch for the Dodgers, who pursued another National League pennant. On the final day of the regular season, their fate hinged on the second game of a doubleheader against the Phillies. Koufax got the ball and pitched on just two days rest. He was fantastic, outdueling Jim Bunning, a future Hall of Famer. Sandy threw a complete game and allowed three runs, two of which were earned. LA won 6-3 and took home their second straight pennant. Sandy finished the year leading the league in game started, innings, wins, ERA, strikeouts, complete games, shutouts, ERA+, plus, FIP, Ks per 9, and pitching war. With 27 wins, a 1.73 ERA, and 317 strikeouts, Koufax clinched the MLB Triple Crown for the third time of his career. He accomplished this in a four-year span from 1963 to 1966. No other pitcher has led the major leagues in all three categories a total of three times since 1900. His five consecutive ERA titles are also an MLB record. The only players to win more in their careers are Lefty Grove and Roger Clemens. Koufax's three seasons with 300 or more strikeouts ranks third, only behind Randy Johnson and Nolan Ryan, who each did it six times. In the World Series, the Dodgers matched up with the Orioles. After a 5-2 loss in Game 1, Koufax took the ball on three days rest for Game 2. Unfortunately, his defense did not do him any favors, committing six errors. Koufax allowed four runs in six innings, however, only one of them was earned. Claude Osteen and Don Drysdale were stellar in the next two games, but the Orioles received back-to-back -back shutouts courtesy of Wally Bunker and Dave McNally. LA was shut out three games in a row, and the Orioles swept their way to their first title. It was a deflating series, but Koufax received proper acknowledgement for his terrific season. He claimed his third Cy Young Award and is currently one of just 11 pitchers to win this honor three or more times. He also finished runner-up to Roberto Clemente in MVP voting. Make sure to check out my Roberto Clemente video. On November 18, 1966, Koufax announced his retirement from baseball at just 30 years old. His decision felt abrupt to many, but it was something he thought out long before the 66 season ended. The arthritis in his elbow was a factor that influenced his choice to retire early. For his career, he accumulated a 48.9 war, 165 wins, a 2.76 ERA, 2,396 strikeouts, and 137 complete games, with 40 of those being shutouts. He was a seven-time All-Star, won five ERA titles, four World Series, three Triple Crowns, three Cy Young Awards, the 1963 MVP, and was named World Series MVP in both 1963 and 1965. Not to mention, he threw four no-hitters in three immaculate innings. When viewing Sandy Koufax's tenure in MLB, there's a striking difference between his first six years and his final six years. From 1955 to 1960, he averaged a 4.1 ERA and 5.3 walks per nine. He won 36 games and lost 40. From 1961 to 1966, he averaged a 2.19 ERA and 2.3 walks per nine. He won 129 games and lost 47. Norm Sherry's advice all those years ago helped to shape Koufax into the legend we know today. There are certain Sandy stats that are unbelievable, but entirely true. For example, he had a 1.37 ERA at Dodger Stadium, the lowest of any pitcher at any ballpark with a minimum of 500 innings. Pure absurdity. Also, his .95 ERA in the World Series is the lowest in history for a pitcher with at least five starts. In 1972, Koufax was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, making him the youngest in the history of Cooperstown. In the following decades, he worked as a broadcaster, minor league pitching coach, and advisor for the Dodgers. While he has occasionally agreed to throw out the first pitch at Dodger Stadium, he rarely makes public appearances. At the time of this video, Sandy is about to celebrate his 88th birthday. 
Sandy Koufax's uncertain start and sudden transformation into an all-time great composed an inspiring story of perseverance and unwavering dedication. Despite dealing with numerous injuries that stole a portion of his prime, Koufax never missed a beat. He was a resilient workhorse on the mound and played through the pain whenever possible. In just 12 years, he set a plethora of records, some of which still stand today. Few can say they left at the pinnacle of their game. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts on the video. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.